This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much indeed and welcome to Senate House. I'm Dr. Sue Onslow, Senior Lecturer in the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I'm uh, stepping in for Professor Philip Murphy, who sadly cannot chair this important, and I must say very welcome occasion um, today, and he presents his apologies. However, it gives me great pleasure uh, to act as chair for our current um, Emeka Anioko Visiting Inaugural Lecture by Professor Susan Parnell. Um, Susan, this uh, visiting professor professorship is for distinguished academics who specialize in Commonwealth Studies. It's a visiting um, research position for three to six months, enabling distinguished foreign um, academics to come here to London at Senate House to continue their research projects. Now, Commonwealth Studies is broadly interpreted to include a variety of disciplines, development studies, history, political science, human rights, or relating to the Commonwealth in a transnational context, or indeed looking at individual countries. Now, that's definitely to our advantage because it enables us to uh, pursue eclectic and interdisciplinary studies. And I'm particularly delighted that today we had the inaugural workshop of our new post-colonial studies center, which was organized by the new early career scholar, uh, Dr. Catherine Gilbert, which pulled in um, a considerable number of leading scholars in post-colonial studies. So this has been a, an excellent day for us here at Senate House. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Parnell to you. Um, she um, asked, could she please come here to Senate House to consolidate her research in an African rather than a South African context, emphasizing historical urban research. Um, uh, I remember her application letter which emphasized that she wanted to look at the origins of Africa's urban crisis and the reasons that lie behind the current inability of local authorities to manage risk, or rather not manage risk, I seem to remember your, your letter stated. Um, so looking at municipal, um, traditional urban land use, its management and finance, and evolu evolution or not of public services such as environmental health, fire, ambulances, uh, building codes, um, and such stuff. Uh, uh, Professor Parnell has been looking particularly while she's been studying here um, at the Kenyan, Nigerian, and Malawian case studies. Um, she is a distinguished South African scholar, um, currently uh, an urban geographer in the Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences at the University of Cape Town, and she's also on the executive committee of the African Center for Cities at UCT. Uh, she's held uh, a number of, of um, academic positions prior to this, at Wits University and at the University of London, at SOAS, which of course is just across the way. In fact, they have indeed moved into Senate House, into our North Block. Uh, she also held visiting research fellowships at the LSE, my own alma mater, Oxford University, Durham, the British Academy, and she was also Leverhulme Visiting Fellow at University College London in 2012. She's a widely published author, uh, of a number of scholarly papers, and her recent co-edited books include Climate at a City State, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, at City Scale, um, A Routledge Handbook of Cities of the Global South, and Africa's Urban Revolution. She served on a number of editorial boards um, of, a num of many ISI-ranked academic journals dealing with urban and development issues. So she has had um, an illustrious academic career, and it has given us great pleasure to welcome her here um, to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Parnell. Thank you, uh, Sue. I, I, it, is, it is really wonderful to be here. Um, wonderful in the immediate sense of, of this evening, and, and to look out and see uh, what I, I've had the privilege of looking at the list of who's in the room, some of whom I recognize by name, some of whom I recognize by face, uh, some by reputation, and, and others who I look forward to meeting. But I do know that we constitute a very diverse group of people who are concerned with matters which are not just about the immediate city uh, in which we live. And it's 
a pleasure to be here in the somewhat bigger sense of that because uh, holding this visiting fellowship represents one of those immense privileges that one gets very rarely these days, in fact, as an academic, which is not only that you have sabbatical time from your host institution, but that you are able to spend consolidated and free time in a place as stimulating and as wonderful uh, as, as central London uh, is. Uh, and in the best of academic traditions, I'm afraid I'm going to deviate slightly, not from the title that you see um, on the screen before you, but rather from the specifics of the project on the history of risk, uh, which is what I've been spending some of my time doing. What I'm going to do instead is to use this notion of an inaugural lecture, not to talk about everything that I have done in my academic career, but in some of the projects that have come to fruition while I have been here uh, in London, because I think that represents an interesting moment in the evolution of big debates about cities uh, and debates about uh, the world as we know them and the role of cities in that world. And so uh, I hope that you'll stay with me and at moments when you know a lot about what I'm going to say, stick with me because I will get, I hope, to some new terrain and in moments when this is very unfamiliar territory. I hope I give you sufficient uh, of the ABC to, to be able uh, for you to, to carry with me. And so I want to start on something uh, which has perhaps been in, in, in the popular uh, press in significant ways, and many of you will be familiar and aware that the United Nations has recently endorsed what are known as the Sustainable Development Goals, also referred to confusingly as the 2030 Vision, and I want to argue tonight that these mark out what we might call a consolidation of a global urban policy. And that, I'm suggesting, is both significant because it is new and it is significant because it represents a fundamental shift in the importance that is attributed to the urban question. So, the way that this gets expressed in the shorthand is unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which there were eight, now we have 17 SDGs, or Sustainable Development Goals, and number 11 is about cities. But the question of cities infuses all of those goals, some much more actively than others. So questions like inequality, um, one would be hard-pressed to understand without a very specific urban lens. Some of the more traditional questions like health, those of you who are health professionals here, of course, have urban manifestations and urban dynamics, uh, but it remains a very conventional terrain of uh, thinking about human livelihoods and, and, and well-being uh, in particular ways. But the introduction of an urban and explicitly a dedicated focus on cities is really very, very new. And what's important about that is not only these high level, and some of you will be very skeptical quite rightly, about these terribly high level statements about the sort of the world we want to live in uh, by 2030. Uh, but what is significant about this is not only the new agendas that they represent, but the kinds of metrics that are being introduced which are going to measure our progress against those goals. And certainly some people argue that it's in the finer detail of what the precise targets are and the indicators are that governments are going to report against that our practice in the allocation of resources, our practice in the prioritization of various policies will shift. And it's significant, the SDGs are significant because what they represent is a consensus from member states. It's exactly why they're so willy, yeah? is because they represent a consensus. And sometimes it's only when you look back and you look at how the consensus has evolved over time that you begin to realize that there really were some precipitous shifts. And we'll go and I'll get to talking uh, about some of the historical dynamics of that. So I will focus to some extent on goal 11, but I don't want to essentialize that as the only element of what I'm calling a global urban agenda. Indeed, it would be much more fair to say that insofar as there is an articulated position of nation states 
on urban questions. It's not, the, the new urban SDG is a fulcrum of an earlier and an ongoing debate where you can find much more substance in what was known as the habitat process. Anybody heard of habitat? Half of you, I would imagine. Some of you not. Okay, so habitat is to human settlements uh, what Rio was to environment. It's the conference that is held every 20 years at which the detail and the, uh, the, the vision, if you like, the, the, and, and then an implementation plan of what governments should be doing about human settlements. And significantly, the first two conferences were spoken of as conferences about human settlement. Whereas now, the next conference happens to be the first of these big new UN cycles uh, on these global meetings, is articulated and, and labeled, is, is, is titled, Housing and Sustainable Urban Development. Okay? So we've shifted from a focus on housing to a focus on a much wider urban agenda. A fascinating aside the other day, uh, great intellectual tradition of meeting in coffee shops, uh, but somebody was uh, reflecting and, and suggesting that in fact some of the focus on housing rather than on any other element of the urban agenda is very much something that emerges out of a British tradition of policy making. It's certainly something that you see in the UK's own policy making where there hasn't been a focus on local government, there hasn't been a focus on wider questions of planning. And that, in fact, this genesis of a focus on housing rather than a focus on a wider set of urban dynamics may date in part to British influence. It was an aside and it is something that should be worth pursuing. Partly what I'm suggesting, though, as we go into this discussion, is that this urban agenda, this post-2015 agenda, is already very significant. It's information, it's not consolidated, we've got a meeting still to come. There are a whole lot of things that are happening. But the fact that there has been an expression of the kind that there has in the SDGs marks out some big transitions. And it's worth summarizing what those are. Let me do that for you and just try and be really crisp in your head when you sort of try and, try and park your skepticism for about the UN for a moment, yeah? And try and think about the shift of what I'm suggesting about the normative position that is there. So, in 1948, we know that the UN embraces the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it remains a powerful imagery as we think about who we take to war crimes, uh, on war crimes, what we aspire to for individuals. What this goal does is that it begins to talk about, or it begins to make possible a very different vision of human rights, one that is universal. For the first time, it's extraordinary, we're in the 21st century, for the first time we are talking about minimum standards for the global south as being the same as they are for the global north. Water entitlements, waste entitlements, housing standards. So when you think about the poorest person in Oslo, that their minimum rights should be the same as the minimum rights of somebody in Dar es Salaam. Okay? So that's one respect in which this is very different. It's a universal agenda. The MDGs only apply to the Global South. The SDGs are universal. It opens up the discussion, and there's a huge back discussion going on, about whether there should be something uh, known as the right to the city. In other words, not just the right to citizenship and statehood, or individual rights, quality of life rights, but also the right to the city, and if there is what that should be. Many people think they won't make it through the discussion in Habitat 3, but it is there and it is present, and it is what some of the NGOs and civil society are pushing for. The second thing that the SDGs do is that they introduce a discussion about inequality as well as poverty. Now that's very different if you come out of a development aid agenda. Okay, it's profoundly different. The focus to date has always been on poverty, poverty reduction, poverty alleviation. Now we're talking about poverty and inequality. Very different. Fundamentally, the SDGs, by endorsing Goal 11, have opened up the idea that the UN should engage not just with nation states. Now I'm sure there are some of you in the room who are political scientists, you will understand the symbolic uh, value of simply of nation states uh, as the community uh, of which the international world 
uh, is composed. And here we're saying, what's the role for local government? Is there a role for local government? And how do you position local government within the UN system? Perhaps the most important position to shift with the SDGs is, and perhaps it's why so many of the global North countries actually endorsed and brought on, uh, brought into the SDG process, was the shift from simply a social and possibly economic focus, which there was in the SDGs, to saying we have to have an ecological agenda. So this is about climate change, and it's about biodiversity, and it's about ecosystem services. So the, the, the push for the sustainable development goals is unambiguously a push for the reinsertion of the ecological into uh, the discourse and to the measures. And then finally, there's a very big discussion that what uh, we are about to enter into are a very different set of metrics. If you follow discussions on things like GDP and questions about whether there are alternative measures uh, of development, clearly implicit in the idea of the new indicators that are going to come out of the SDGs, whether it's the urban SDG or the health SDG or the education SDG, is that there will be new indicators. Now it's much more likely that the health people who already have a set of metrics are going to hold on to what they've always had. But in new communities, like the urban community, there are real questions about what we will elevate to say these are priority interventions that we wish to track and how those begin to uh, infect what we do. So, a process that is still underway. I've already indicated that these indicators have not been confirmed. So, the fuzzy text on the left is all the detail, which was much debated, you can imagine, in UN speak, of the targets have been decided, the goals have been decided, but the indicators have not. Okay, and that is up for discussion. The second thing which is underway at the moment is that an urban SDG has been approved, but now we are moving towards that last point number D of a big meeting for Habitat, and there is a text that is being prepared. And in that text, the devil is in, the detail of that wording, the focus is thrust, and of course that is what is being prepared uh, and discussed at the various prep comps. Interestingly, in these big conferences that take place every 20 years, there are very important regional meetings. Okay, So the positions are put forward by the African lobby, by the Latin American lobby, and I'll come to talk about what this stuff means for Africa uh, in a second. Okay, so I hope you agree with me that what we have is something which is looking quite different. For the first time, we recognize that there is a global position on cities. It's not clear, it's not confirmed, but there is something which we can identify as a position statement that governments have bought into. And that wasn't always the case. That's new. There were elements of that, but it was very poorly endorsed, it was informal quite often, it existed in different kinds of sectoral bodies, and I'll talk you through some of those in a second. Certainly, from the 1980s, when we had global positions on things like sustainable development, the post-Rio environment, there was not very much recognition of the role that cities played in sustainable development. And now, that is very explicit. The idea that if you're going to achieve sustainable development, if you're going to achieve some form of ecological transition, if you're going to meet climate change objectives or biodiversity targets, you have to engage the urban question. That is new. And so, what I want us to do is to get into some of this discussion of how did this happen? How did this come about? Where does it come from? And the tricky part is, is that the UN is murky, it's big, it's uh, an organization that is not particularly transparent, and it has become more complex uh, through time. Nonetheless, I want us to try, and this is the point Sue was making in, in, in my motivation on coming to Commonwealth Studies, and it's wonderful, I have to say, to be in the room, uh, coincidentally, I think, with, with two of the people who were my PhD examiners. Um, and so Richard Dennis and Shula Marks are both in the room in days when I uh, engaged explicitly with questions historical. And, and, and Richard and Shula 
the, the long role models of the importance of the historical in trying to understand uh, overall dynamics about society and social change, but particularly for me, those have become really important ways of trying to understand the future. And so here, in a very schematic way, is some of the historical perspective on the global urban development agenda. And I think the first thing to say is that it is not a UN process. The effort to get an international consensus about cities predates the UN. Okay, so we can look, there was a meeting in London in 2010, Riva uh, hosted, it was frankly deeply chaotic, really badly organized meeting, uh, an equally disorganized meeting uh, in, in Belgium. Uh, both attempts to bring together uh, as part of this kind of new drive, the sort of rise of municipalism, an effort to get a global community of people interested in cities, interested in municipalities, interested in planning, to talk to each other directly, not mediated by their governments. So there's a very long history to that. But that was very much focused on the global north, on Europe, and to some extent on what went on in North America. At the same time, there is a, a, a quite a sophisticated set of scientific and technical communities that considered colonial policy, not the individual policy of countries, pre-Kenya, pre-Uganda, pre-independence in, in significant kinds of ways. Um, the tendency there was very much to look at sectors, and some sectors were given a lot more uh, emphasis than others. So, uh, housing, and I go back to my, my anecdote from the coffee shop, um, housing was a privileged sector. So if you go into the colonial office records, there are extensive discussions about the cost of housing, about the form of construction, um, about the labor processes that were there, about how one could regulate and control uh, occupation of housing, much less about a whole lot of other aspects uh, of urban development. And it's partly this focus of these technical committees, which were international, not just in their convening, but also in the scope of the, the places and contexts that they, they examined. So India and Africa uh, and the Caribbean were considered in some senses as interchangeable points of reference and comparison. Uh, but the tendency was almost always uh, to focus on questions of control and cost, and not on questions of basic needs, uh, or, and I'm going to come back to this idea later on, for those of you who come out of the, uh, the post-colonial uh, meeting, not on questions of what it meant to be an urbanite. What did it mean to be a citizen of a city uh, in that place and context? And it's that uh, kind of schizophrenic understanding of, of cities that I think gives some of uh, this idea of global policy making really quite a bad name. <coughs> If we take that longer view of history that some of us are, are, are increasingly interested in and we begin to sort of uh, locate the colonial period in a much longer trajectory, the independence period I think is particularly interesting in terms of the emergence of global urban policy making because nothing happened that took on the questions of the global south. It's not that there weren't discussions about urban reconstruction, there absolutely were. Okay? So the Marshall Plan, uh, the major questions about the reconstruction of European cities uh, focused pretty much uh, on, on Europe and, and uh, didn't consider what were, by that stage, beginning to be some fairly rapidly growing cities in Africa and Latin America, Latin America in particular. And the post-independence period, at least in the African context, and those of you who are Latin Americanists may have a, a different take uh, on this, is one that is marked out by the fact that the transition to independence is a transition about the creation of nation states. It is not a period in which there is really any detailed consideration to what should happen in cities. So if we look back, the 50s and the 60s and even a little into the 1970s is a period of silence. There's very little discussion internationally uh, about the urban condition and about urban policy. Now, ironically, that changes into the 1970s, and it changes uh, largely because of the way that the World Bank became involved in, not in urban questions, but in questions about poverty. Now, uh, Bob McNamara, who is the Secretary of Defense, um, 
was incredibly influential in this regard and he moves into the World Bank and decides that the bank is going to become the repository of action and knowledge on questions of poverty. And that individual decision to promote an institutional home, a place which provided for systematic analysis, for detailed collection of data of a very particular kind, for a very particular reason, enabled the shift away from investment in European places and contexts into what we understand as the global south today. And that gave the question of poverty an institutional home. Now, the bank, and there are people in the room who know a lot more about this and can flesh this out, the bank has never dealt very well with the urban question, nor, nor have many donors, lots of organizations struggle because, where do you put it, what is the urban? Yeah? It's not, a, it's not a, an, an easy to identify set of expertise, it, con it comes from engineering, it comes from planning, it comes from architecture, it's got educational educations. And the bank never dealt particularly well with it, but it has had an enduring engagement, both with questions of poverty and with questions of the urban. And I'll come back to the role of McNamara in a little. But I just want to give you the sense that there are this periodized history, if you like, of uh, the evolution of a global urban policy system. And for me, there's a sort of irony, because what happens in the late 19, uh, 20th century is that the debate about an international position, a, cons a global consensus on cities, moves into the UN. Okay, and I think this could be the case of death. Um, maybe we will look back and think that. And, uh, there are very real dangers associated with that. But you all know that the UN is divided into the Security Council and the Economic and Social Council. And the Economic and Social Council uh, began to take a series of, of big global policy positions. And it's those policy, if you're a health person, the WHO will be implementing uh, the health agenda. Uh, UNEP engages with and implements the decisions coming out of Rio. Um, and the human settlement agenda is one that becomes part of uh, what the UN puts its collective mind to uh, and debates. Significantly, at the very moment that the UN, this deeply bureaucratic nation-state formulated organization, is beginning to take these global positions, civil society manages to find a space to engage the global process. Okay? So we get big global NGOs emerging for the first time. ICLE. You want to hear from ICLE? Okay. The local government that Michele's over there has worked extensively with ICLE would be a very good example uh, of the kind of NGO that manages to engage the global agenda, deeply influential in that Rio meeting. Uh, UCLG comes along in 2004, the United Councils of Local Government, uh, the Cities Alliance, there are a range of, of, of those, SDI and the Slum Rivers International, and they begin to engage the, the, the urban agenda. Let me show you how and why that comes into being. We're going to take a step backwards, and I just want to look at those three human settlements conferences to demonstrate what I've just been saying. Habitat 1, Habitat 2, and the one that's to happen later this year, Habitat 3. Are you with me? Okay, good. Um, so Habitat One was in Vancouver. Um, and I, I don't know if there was anybody here who was there. Um, but it, it, ah, there, so there are some hands. And I was gonna say, it, 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 by all accounts, quite a hippie looking affair. And I can see from here that there's a man with a beard at the back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where the significant discussion took place, not so much in the formal negotiations, but actually, in the tents outside, because that's what they landed up uh, using. And what is really significant about the deliberations at the Vancouver meeting were a couple of things. First of all, uh, were the people who were there, always. And so the intellectuals who drove that agenda, who had been facilitated, their presence was facilitated through an interesting route I'll come to in a second, included people like Ward, Schumacher, Alan Illich, um, John Turner, who used to work uh, at the DPU, uh, just over the road at, at, at UCL. And significantly, they focused very actively, both on 
environmental question, way ahead of their time, and on the question of participation. You'll see how that replays in a second. The other thing which came out of the, the, um, the Habitat uh, uh, meeting in Vancouver was the creation for the first time of a dedicated UN agency of UN Habitat, based in Nairobi, probably one of the least effective of the UN agencies for a range of reasons, but nonetheless, that's its origins. By the time we get to 20 years later, and I, I was at the Istanbul meeting, I know there are at least a couple of other people at the Istanbul meeting, two of us, okay. Um, and in fact, one of those people is Caroline Moser, who I want to just speak about, it's just stuck up her hand, because the intellectuals who drove the agenda in that time and context were different. Um, and it represents both a continuity and a break. Because if you go back and you think about what were the big debates at the meeting in uh, Istanbul, the one really important discussion was the discussion about whether there should be a right to housing. Okay? With a, and that had huge implications if you recognize the right to housing. The Americans were very opposed to that. Because just like on the question of migration, if you recognize somebody as a refugee, then you are morally obliged to begin to start intervening. Actually, the recognition of the right to housing was something that nobody believed would happen. In fact, as it turns out, that was brokered. And Habitat II endorsed the right to housing. Okay? In, and it's had unintended and quite problematic consequences because it's quite often led to eradication of slum programs uh, in the name of the creation of the right to housing. But nonetheless, that was a right that was fought uh, and a battle that was fought and won. Personally, I think that the battles and the agenda setting items uh, at that time had much more to do with questions of gender. At the time, and Karen Levy, and Caroline Moser, various other people, many of whom were London based, were very involved in the work on gender and the city. And it's that kind of thinking that fundamentally transformed the way that development was understood, but also the wider understanding of the city, not just with respect to housing. And the pushing of the intellectual agenda of what did it mean to be born a man or a woman in an urban context was absolutely the point of discussion from the Istanbul meeting. So, the focus on housing, the focus on gender, an endorsement, not a negation, but perhaps not the affirmation as loudly as it might otherwise have been, of the environmental agenda and of the participation agenda uh, at that meeting. And so what we see happening here, these three, uh, the blue, is Vancouver, the green is Habitat 2 in Turkey, uh, and it's about to be Habitat 3 uh, in Quito. And the question is, is what are we likely to anticipate in this evolving, this emerging, this consolidating urban agenda? Now, I've already suggested that what marks out the present moment is a shift from an understanding of the city in fairly narrow sectoral terms of human settlement, in other words, things which have to do with your house, your household, to the sorts of questions which have to do with public space, with the interconnections between space, with the economy, with the resource flows uh, through the city. And there is every expectation that the SDG 11 brings in a much more holistic understanding of the challenge than we have had to date. Coupled with that is this really difficult political question, because what it implies is a shift of some kind of devolution. And I don't have to, sitting in England or Britain, uh, tell you and spell out in one of the most centralized parts of the world ever, uh, that the politics of devolution can be very difficult. Um, it's difficult in Africa, it's difficult uh, in, in this kind of context too. But, but the questions of fiscal decentralization, uh, how do you get enough money uh, to do the sorts of things that you have to do in an urban context? Uh, how do you raise enough money? What does it mean to allocate the power to raise money to the subnational scale rather than simply making cash transfers? Uh, 
Um, there's a resurrection of a technical agenda around planning, um, and where there are a whole range of ways that the, the discussion about Habitat 3 is focused on this ecological integration back to questions of climate change and risk. And I, again, I shall come to that in a second. So we've got these big three meetings, but the reason that the NGOs were so able to engage the emergence of this global process was because at Rio, they created something <coughs> called the Open Working Group Structure. And all that meant was that in order, prior to approval of a resolution, there would be an extended series of meetings, open working groups, and the people who were able to come and make representation there were formally endorsed, they were recognized. So a line of participation was opened up. But it wasn't opened up to five or six million people, billion people, whatever the number was at that time. You had to go through particular channels. And they recognized nine major groups. The scientific and technological community, that's us, academics, was one of them. Local government was another one. Uh, Garrett's here from uh, local government, he can tell us more. Women was one, NGOs were one. They're very much a product of the time. And one of the criticisms of that process is that it's got rather stuck, okay? So if you weren't already in a category, transgender people don't necessarily fit into a group on women, yeah? Uh, there, there are a whole, uh, are the ecological social movements the same as NGOs, or should they have a separate and different kind of space? Uh, there are real questions about the, the relative weight that each of these movements get. And so there are very real concerns about the nature of the participatory process. And in case you can't recognize from the back, that is the same scarf that I'm wearing tonight. And one of the things, all of the, all of the work that I'm presenting to you tonight comes out of papers that have been completed while here or initiated while here. And this is a, a small piece that I wrote for um, a chapter in a book about the limits to participation. And it's a, it's a biographical piece in a sense because it reveals and talks about the fact that not only do you, in making these representations to the UN, on what are profound matters of allocation, of power, uh, of setting of, of, of agendas, you have to belong to these groups. But in order to get the right to speak, the UN decides who can and cannot be there. And of course, being the UN, that means it has to be distributed across the world. So Muggins, who happens to be a woman from the Global South and from Africa, spoke not once but twice. Um, and you can see how incredibly problematic that is if you are looking for a set of representat representative uh, arguments. Perhaps more important than that, or as important as that, is that you get two minutes to make your case. And so on one occasion I was speaking on behalf of the entire scientific community uh, to tell them what I thought should happen about cities, and I got to two minutes. Uh, and on the other occasion, I was speaking on behalf of the entire African continent, uh, and I got three minutes. Um, so, so some extremely serious concerns um, about how much critical ref uh, reflection there is at that point. And c clearly, the way the UN system works is not through these very large uh, lobbying and public um, displays of lobbying. Instead, what it does is that it tends to work as do many political processes, and uh, we, uh, as historians, the sort of following some of these people who are deeply influential has always been one way of tracking change. Uh, but there certainly are a set of individuals, I'm sure there are some destructive ones, but these happen to be examples of people who were uh, useful and, and progressive who played an important role. So I've already indicated the role of intellectuals uh, at various points. Uh, here are some people who were, in a sense, played a slightly different role. Um, activist intellectuals, interlocutors in, in particular kinds of ways. So, the, and, and there's a relationship between them, and, and that's what I want to just highlight for you here, is that Bob McMurray was absolutely, because of his role in the American uh, political establishment key to delivering what would happen at Habitat 1. His person and his relationship is with somebody called Barbara Ward, um, who was his special advisor. 
Now, Barbara Ward uh, was a well-known ecologist, uh, had an uh, eco-activist, and was in fact uh, closely associated with IIED, which is also just around the corner here. Um, and it's largely through her influence, I think, that the speakers who were there, that the activist intellectuals who were there, uh, were present. And we land up with that very progressive agenda as early as 1976 uh, in that first Habitat meeting. It was also Barbara Ward who appointed the young David Satterthwaite um, into a position of organizing the Civil Society Conference, uh, which I suspect was a bit like giving uh, a graduate student a job to do. Um, only it turned into something a whole lot more important uh, than that. And there's a, a very interesting account, and I strongly advise that over uh, a drink you find, Caroline, Caroline, why don't you just wave your hand? <laughs> Severity is being uh, demure. But these pivotal people, because there's an ongoing relationship uh, between the institutions of higher education, the DPU in this case, and the training uh, of this cohort of people who come to influence the global agenda in particular kinds of ways. David Sathwaite probably has more say as an individual of the evolution of these three conferences than any one uh, other in individual. Interestingly, he, in a sense, has handed over a baton, perhaps, to the other person whose photograph is there, who's somebody called Aramar Reddy, who some of you all know from the Indian Institute for Human Settlements. Um, and they connect partly through the IPCC and the Urban Chapter on Climate Change. And it's because Arama really gets directly involved in the shaping and the pushing for a global urban SDG on the back of much of the, the, the kind of the networks which come out of the urban focus and the urban chapter uh, of the work on climate change that uh, an urban SDG campaign is launched. People are important, institutions are important, but I'm not suggesting for a moment that we can distill everything to these hubs or these key points. I think what is really significant, and one of the other papers that's come out while uh, I have been here as a piece in, in environmental urbanization, which has got a special issue coming out on the SDGs, is to say that across a whole range of academic debates, which are deeply fragmented, and I, how much time have I got? 10 minutes? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. I'll, I'll walk you through some of those. They're very fragmented debates. People don't agree with each other at all, and there are parallel debates which don't talk to each other at all. Yeah? So we've got sort of rivulets, if you like, of conflict in a stream of a discussion about the city. What stands out from all of these is that perhaps more than for the last 40, 50 years, perhaps, there is a consensus that cities are important. Okay? An absolute consensus that cities are important. Nobody agrees on why they're important, or on how they're important, or how to make them more important. But there is a consensus that the city is important. And I just want to give you, for those of you who aren't urbanists, and uh, you can phase out for two minutes while I just uh, track you through a couple of these streams, or maybe you'll find it interesting. So, so just to, to, to give you a, a sense of, of these debates. So there's a debate raging about what's called planetary urbanism. And I'm going to stereotype this of saying what planetary urbanism argues is that the city is everywhere. In other words, the city reaches into everything. And it doesn't matter whether you go to space or whether you go under the sea, you'll get the cables, which are connect, which are the sphere of influence, which connect back into the city. That's one argument. So for them, cities are important because they're everywhere, not because they're concentrations in any particular way. That's very different from the argument which has come out about the Anthropocene. I don't know if you've been following this discussion about the Anthropocene, the idea that we are in a fundamentally new geological era, which one can track literally in the earth and the sediments of what gets left behind, which have to do with industrialization and urban life. The urban Anthropocene, some people would call it. Um, and that's a very different argument. You can see these nuances from the one which says, actually what's really important, the ecologists in particular, argue about resilience. And their argument is, is that what happens is that cities are the trigger points, the tipping points, because of the way that resources are consumed. Water, for example. We change the nitrogen flows so dramatically that we actually fundamentally potentially shift ecosystems. 
And that's a very different argument. Depending on which of those you followed, you'd land up in a very different kind of intervention. That's one cluster of arguments. There's another cluster of arguments, and they were very influential, probably the most influential constituency in securing an urban SDG. <coughs> Something of an embarrassment to the social scientists that in fact the people who eventually brokered the SDG almost all came out of the natural sciences. Um, nonetheless, there has been and there is a very important constituency uh, which debates uh, a series of, and, and again, this is a, there are different versions of this, uh, what might be called global urbanism. The idea that we have to have some bigger consensus views on how we understand cities, which recognize cities everywhere, if I use my colleague Jenny Robinson's phrase. And she argues that basically all cities need to be recognized on their own terms. She uses the idea of an ordinary city. That's very different from somebody like Ananya Roy, who in some senses argues that what sets cities apart and why we need to rethink the way that we understand cities with different entry points is that we're living in an Asian century. And the 21st century is one of Asian urbanism. Some of my colleagues at the African Center for Cities would go down a fairly similar track, if not to argue that African cities are actually distinctive, to argue that you have to understand the distinctiveness of problems which manifest in those cities in particular kinds of ways. And there are others who would take that even one further to make a case for what would be called southern urbanism. Okay? And the idea that only scholars of the south actually can begin to start positioning a distinctive theoretical and empirical understanding. That you have to actually in some way be politically part of uh, and distance yourself from the more conventional kind of canon. And they reflect wider debates uh, in the social sciences. There are similarly very significant discussions going on within the economic sector uh, about why cities are important to accumulation, how uh, and whether or not cities are the drivers uh, of the economy, uh, what the relationship is between cities and financial markets, in particular some of the uh, financial systems that have emerged around housing and housing allocation. And so a renewed doesn't matter which of these schools you come from or where your literature is embedded. What the point I'm making is just as the rise of NGOs, the emergence of a constituency who pushed for an urban agenda was important. The evolution of the UN system to enable a more porous articulation and debate about what the future constituted facilitated a discussion on cities. So too, what was going on in the academy was really important in ensuring uh, that the urban agenda got uh, traction. Now, the problem is, and uh, Clive Barnett and I have just published a piece which argues that it's great that we all agreed that cities were important. The problem is, is that the fight's about to start. <laughs> because this is the moment when you, you all decided that you wanted a wedding, um, and now you realize that actually you have a fundamentally different idea uh, of what you understand. Uh, is embedded in, in this agenda. And uh, here are just one take on why there are very different understandings of what the urban agenda needs. Some people argue that cities are increasingly important sites of economic, of social, of ecological change. In other words, things used to happen in rural areas, now they increasingly, because of urbanization, happen in urban areas. So whereas we used to look at things in a rural context, now we need to do rural and urban. Yeah? It's a good argument. Makes sense. The, demo the demography suggests that that's the way to go. Other people uh, argue differently and they argue that cities are actually the centers of what's happening. In other words, what happens in the city, that's the planetary urbanism argument. Okay? It's the, um, a lot of the ecological arguments are there, uh, or, or the economic arguments are there. Cities are the hubs from which processes get distributed, flow from. The last one is probably the, the most, uh, the, the ecologists make the case most strongly, and their argument is that cities are pathways of, perform, uh, of transformative change. In other words, that because we have cities, things change in ways that are, make them not the same as they were before. Okay? So climate change would be a very good example. Uh, of, of, a, of, of where, you, where you understand 
that cities are the drivers of climate change and the rise of temperature is because of the construction materials that we've had, the energy uh, con concentration that comes from cities. Cities become a pathway uh, of change. And why this scaling of this is really important is that depending on how you view the urban, so you think it is more or less important. Is it important just to make sure we've looked at what happens in cities? Or is it important that cities become the priority point of intervention? Because unless we intervene in cities, we will not get to the agenda that we want. And it's this last argument about pathways that is really particularly important if you take a global perspective. Because if you have a global perspective, what the pathways argument does is it says, doesn't matter where you live, cities everywhere are important to achieving the kinds of transitions that we want. If you want a safe world, one aspect of the urban goals articulation, it doesn't matter whether you live in London, you also have to engage in what's going on in Tripoli. Okay? Because you are connected in some way. What happens in one place is transformative of another set of places. And that really shifts things because it puts the focus, and this is the last bit of, of the talk that I want to come to, uh, and I hope you're still with me, um, as we, we consolidate down to the argument that if you take the, the pathways argument, what happens in cities is fundamental to whether or not the sustainable development goals as a whole are met. But some cities are actually more important than others. And I would argue that what goes on in African cities is really the most important thing. And it's that which the Habitat Agenda has to spell out in a little bit more detail. We've got the high level agreement of the SDG. Now Habitat has to actually say how they're going to realize this thing. And the argument goes that unless Habitat 3 is articulated in ways that work for Africa, it's not going to help anybody. And I know if you can see those pie charts from the back, uh, but what they show you, they're not drawn to scale. And if they were, it would make the point even more potently because their population pie charts, can you see at the back of it, um, is that, I'm going to lose the mic, um, is that the proportion of the world's population that lives in Africa is going to increase from 15% in 2010 to 39% in 2100. How do you say that? Uh, 2100. Yeah? Uh, so, whereas the proportion of the population living in Europe will decline from 11 to 6. In other words, where is the change going to take place? The change is going to occur because of the cities in Africa, which are yet to be built. And they are, because that's for two reasons. One is because of population growth in the African context, uh, at relatively high levels. And the other is because we've currently got relatively low levels of urbanization. There's little in the West African context um, of about 20% at the moment, uh, rising up to nearly 40%. So there's gonna be a movement into town as well as an increase in the natural, uh, in the, the, the population. So we've got a shift in the distribution, we've got a growth in the population, which means a growth in cities, and that's compounded by the fact that Africa has an infrastructure deficit. Okay? So what this graph does, and you can grab it from me later, is it compares various forms of infrastructure in Africa with those in other regions, and it, it it, stay, it, it, um, it's looking for. it makes it, it, it it's comparing like with like middle income and low income in both contexts yeah and what it demonstrates unequivocally is that whereas all low income countries have got a higher deficit of infrastructure than they do in middle income countries if you look at Africa the deficit is even higher okay proportionately it is a much greater deficit in other words the places where we're going to build, the places where we need to intervene, the places where we need to invest are in African cities. And that's not just for African urban residents. It's collectively, it's globally, that's what a global urban policy position uh, uh, seeks to do. Now the good news is that the African Union and a number of uh, processes are underway in the African context where for the first time Africans have actually embraced the urban agenda. They've endorsed the SDGs, they didn't oppose it, unlike the British government. 
Um, they endorsed it. They have endorsed the, the habitat process, and there is a very active process through the African Union that is explicitly open. And I just draw your attention to the, the highlighted piece there, and, uh, it's, and, I, and I read it simply because it, it, it is an African voice expressing an African aspiration that is an urban aspiration. It says, cities and other settlements are hubs of cultural and economic activities with modernized infrastructure, and people have access to the basic necessities of life, including shelter, water, sanitation, energy, public transport, and ICT. It's an urban imaginary of the African development future. This is profoundly different from what we find in the colonial record. It's profoundly different from the post-independence period, which is completely silent about any vision of urban Africa. Of course, it's highly utopian, and all you need to look at are the purple words which are taken from the African uh, agenda. And it says, for Africa, these are the eight principles which they want. They want it to be universal, they want human rights, they want it to be equitable, we want integration, we want empowerment of civil society, sustainability and innovation. Now, any of you who do any sustained work in the African context will know that this is aspirational. Huh? This isn't reflecting what is there in any significant way. And so it seems to me that the task of the Global Urban Agenda and of Habitat 3 in particular is to deal with the question of leadership. Um, so Michael will be very happy to hear me saying that because he works on, on the question of leadership. And it's the leadership which not only sets out a normative base, because the SDGs in some senses have already done that, but it is also one that gives us some clues about what priority interventions will need to be. How, before 2030, given the rapid growth that we are sitting with, are we to achieve uh, these ends? Uh, what are the most appropriate kinds of practices? And perhaps most importantly, how do we begin to start thinking about the financing of the global urban development agenda? And so on the last slide, I want to just leave you uh, with the thought that for a viable global urban agenda, one that is worth more than the standard UN resolution, uh, the urban agenda has to work for Africa. It has to position the continent in global terms which are wise. Wisdom is not something we often think of when we, when we talk about policy, but it does seem to me that this is a moment to make the case that we need wise leaders. We have to understand the political economy of so-called informality and joblessness and unemployment. We have to understand the nature of urban rural linkages because this is the moment which this urbanization transition will take place. <clears throat> it is naive to follow the McKinsey's of the world into thinking that we have a burgeoning middle class in Africa and nothing else. <coughs> and if the vision is one that doesn't speak to the youth and provide skills, it won't get anywhere. And my voice has gone at exactly the right moment. <laughs> Thank you.